Hello, everyone. You are listening to the Continentals Podcast with me, Luis Molina. Today in episode two, we're going to discuss a few port stories, and I will also share with you a few tips. Let's start off with rotability. Did you know how we ended up with rotability? Someone at DCLI shared an interesting story with me, and it involved Gloria Estefan, the singer. In March 1990, a loaded truck rear-ended her tour bus. She was like 32 at the time, ended up with a, a broken vertebrae, underwent surgery uh, later on that month in New York, where they implanted two steel rods in her back. So the, the people getting sued were the driver, the company that he hauled for at the time, uh, Ventura Transport, and Flexivan Leasing, which was the, the, the owner of the chassis. Maersk also got sued, and three other companies that were affiliated with them. Everyone and anyone that had any, anything to do with that load, they were getting a piece of that lawsuit. So... I believe Merce got involved because, one, that's the terminal the product came out of, and two, they were the shipper for the pitted dates in that container. Flexivan, they were the owner of the chassis. They should have kept up to date with the maintenance and whatnot. The driver, for negligence, he should have done his pre-trip. So they just follow everyone involved in that process. So that's why you got to protect yourself when you have your numbers out there don't let anyone just run your shit you gotta protect it if you let your buddy run your authority then he runs a load for his buddy then he kills someone while hauling that load for his buddy your numbers are in the mix now you get pulled into that scenario if your buddy is overweight at the scale your numbers take that hit. It's a big liability letting people run your numbers. So take care of it. That's the livelihood of your business. And don't just let anyone have access to it. A hey, shout out to Phantom Trucks for letting me run his for over a year. Thank you. 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 Ah, fuck. I just had to have fun with this shit a little bit. Hey, moving on. So yeah, that's how Roto came into the picture because someone got hurt. So when that mechanic doesn't want to let you out with an expired bid or federal inspection, don't take it personal. Plus, like, imagine this scenario. Let's say this mechanic lets you go with a bad chassis and that chassis loaded and ends up being the one that, that kills his family out on the road. It's a little extreme of a scenario, but... I hope you get my point. So yeah, ever since Gloria Stefan got rear-ended, we have rotability. And back in the day, to be honest, rotability, when I started, it wasn't really that extreme. It was just checking for flats, making sure the BIT wasn't expired, making sure the federal inspection wasn't expired, and you were on your way. Now it's a little more complicated. Because back then, I don't believe there were any limits. So you had a, a broken tail light, boom, swap it off. You had three flats, boom, switch it up, get some new ones. If you had a BIT, all this other shit, right? If you had combinations, it was no biggie. Today, if you have too many flats or too many broken tail lights and expired inspections, that might end up in you getting sent to the flip line. And that's already a loss because the flip line is a waste of time. Every driver that gets paid by the load hates the flip line. You literally start the process all over. The, the mechanic puts that sticker on your chassis, puts it out of service. You drive, instead of driving away to freedom, you make that quick left and go back into the terminal. You find a slot to park that, that container on wheels. Make sure you write down where you left it at. Now you go start all over, you find a, a chassis, and better make sure it's good, okay? Then you go to the flip line, you tell the clerk where you left the load at, the UTR or yard goat, they will go bring it, drive it up to the machine, the machine will take it off and, and swap chassis pretty much. They'll take it off the bad chassis and put it on your new chassis, so you better make sure you got a good one. 
all of that because the the work isn't getting approved. The the job orders need to get approved by the chassis providers. It's not like before where they would fix everything in Roto. There's some job orders that the bill might be too high and they don't want to approve it. So how did we get here? I don't know. There's there's a lot of ways that I can tell you that I think we got here. Shit, DCLI has been around since 1988. So if they had to suddenly start cutting down on expenses drastically, they, they must be doing it for a reason because they haven't been around this long just because there's a reason for everything. So there's, you know, back then I saw a few times mechanics would break all the lights like for the fuck of it just break all the lights and write up some some kind of receipt replace them with new ones and you were on your way i never understood why or maybe they were beefing it or whatnot but i don't have the full facts i can just share what i saw and to me it didn't make sense to break lights that were in perfect working conditions and to see them bashed in with the with a hammer and replaced with new ones it seemed like a unnecessary expense. So that could be one reason. They wanted to have more control over what they're paying for. Like, if they're paying for it, they want to know why. Another scenario is uh, us truckers. These DCLI has a lot of radial tires on their chassis. And there was this time when a lot of the llanteros were coming up on these radial tires. They'd go to yards and swap them out. Put old ones back on the chassis. These chassis are getting returned with, with fucking melons. So in a way, we, we contribute to all these changes that just result in more wait times. And I don't say this to categorize all mechanics as bad or categorize all tire guys as bad or categorize all drivers or owner-operators as bad. See, owner-operators aren't left out because in cahoots with with tire guys and tire repair guys i've heard of guys running ames tires on their steers and they got him from the plug you know who's the plug the mobile tire guy so for the bad deeds of a few the majority pay the price i guess we sort of do it to ourselves so back to rotability and the chassis situation and flips and all this other shit that comes from there i got a a message sent in by an anonymous mechanic, and it goes like this. They only allow us to work on their chassis a certain amount of paid time. So, for example, if the driver needs a BIT or a PM inspection, and it has a couple of bad tires and a couple of bad taillights that are over the limit for what they want us to do in, in Roto, then they want those chassis returned back to the shop so that the work that is needed can get estimated and approved by DCLI or Flexivan. After the work is approved, then a mechanic can do all the repairs. I'm not sure why they do it that way. Most of the time, the truckers think that we are lying or just being lazy and don't want to perform the work. It sucks for everybody. I do my best to help out, but I'm just one man in the battlefield. So that's what he had to say about that. And now I hope most of you will stop taking it personal when you're asked to flip at Roto now. But I'm going to let you in on a little secret. And that's the golden rule. I've seen guys get off at, at Roto talking shit to the mechanics. And then they get surprised when the mechanic talks shit back. Like, treat others the way you want to be treated. By getting off talking shit, you just make it worse. Based on the last statement, 9 times out of 10, they're doing their job and... We need to not take it personal when we got to flip. Simply put, egos and stressful environments, they don't mix. If you got problems at home, leave that shit at home. If you're, if you're in a bad mood, keep it to yourself. Don't go contaminating everyone with your negative vibes. I'm speaking from experience because every time that I got pissed off and went crazy, lost my temper, talked shit, got off the truck, or anything of, of that nature, I lost. I lost money, I lost terminal access, wasted time, went home empty-handed, and my family deserves better than that. Anytime you let someone push your buttons and take control over you like that, you're taking food out of your family's mouth. You're taking food off the table. Don't give no one control over your emotions to the point where you lose your shit. Some guys are just miserable, and, and they want a reason to 
let out that anger. They want a reason to, to flip out on you and exercise their authority over you to feel superior and feel better about themselves because they're fucking up your day. Misery loves company, you know? I would always try to avoid those lanes. Fr from a distance, I can see which one was at which lane. Some road abilities have a lot of lanes. I would get the flip sticker on my chassis and go back into the terminal like if I was going to go park it, but I would just go, I'll go back around, I would line up and pull up to Roto again, but this time I would pick another lane. And like 50% of the time, I got away with it. I just had to make sure that the flip sticker was removed on both sides of the chassis, the front and the back, because that's a giveaway. Also, I had to make sure I chose a lane that was far enough apart from the one where the other guy was at. We all just want to get out of that shithole as soon as possible, man. We try all kinds of shit. There's there's guys that will spray paint tires that say B.O., mud flaps that say B.O. B.O. stands for bad order, so that is a major red flag when going through Roto. You see guys that are picking up a load that's on wheels. So all the wheeled loads are parked next to other wheeled loads, obviously. So that creates this little security barrier for you to do any work you need to do but you see guys installing mud flaps installing lights borrowing quote unquote lights from the chassis next to their load you don't want to get caught doing any of that at most terminals they will chew you out and ban you so the last thing i want to say about roadability is that not all the mechanics are or assholes or rude some even have contenero stickers on their toolboxes one of them makes the containers decals for us and all these friendships were made because i treated them with respect and as one of them mentioned to me one, one day in, in the dms he said i wish we could trade jobs for a day that way there would be more respect for each other on both ends so remember the golden rule when you're pulling up i know at times dealing with people it can be hard a really good book that has shifted my perspective is one called The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene. I'm going to read two of the laws for you guys. If you want the remaining 46, make sure you check out that book. Law number 40. Despise the free lunch. What is offered for free is dangerous. It usually involves either a trick or a hidden obligation. What has worth is worth paying for. By paying your own way, you stay clear of gratitude, guilt, and deceit. It is also often wise to pay the full price. There is no cutting corners with excellence. Be lavish with your money and keep it circulating, for generosity is a sign and a magnet for power. Law 28. Enter action with boldness. If you are unsure of a course of action, do not attempt it. Your doubts and hesitations will infect your execution. Timidity is dangerous. It's better to enter with boldness. Any mistakes you commit through audacity are easily corrected with more audacity. Everyone admires the bold. No one honors the timid. So moving on, I want to share a, a couple of my chassis tips and tricks, a few stories. Back in the day, when I wanted to save a chassis for a buddy, I would carry red paint and spray paint the front of it to make it seem like it was out of service. We would drop the landing gear, actually raise the landing gear as high as possible and drop it. And I would let them know what spot I left it at. So any other trucker that didn't know what's going on, he would see that chassis all the way down on the ground, tilted, you know, with the red paint. It was unattractive, so most of the time, practically all the time, the chassis would still be there when my buddy would arrive. That's one of the tricks we had. Or if you were really cool with him, you would park in his spot and wait for him to pull up bobtail. So as soon as he would pull up, you would unhook, and he would hook up, and he would already be in his spot waiting for the machine to give him his load. And let's not forget the collection of BIT stickers that we would keep in the truck. 
or the chassis pit stories, guys are about to fight over a chassis, and, and then the one that gets it, it turns out to be one of those bad chassis with like three flats. Then he looks stupid because the machine brings down another chassis that's in great condition for the guy that he was fighting. Or guys pull up and they block like three chassis at a time. They get off and run to the back and, and check them for flats. So they like cover their ass. You know, they got three times the the likelihood of getting a chassis. That's kind of, that shit would annoy me. There's some that took it a step further. They blocked off three chassis. So you pull up and you're going to back up into maybe the fourth one or the fifth one because this fucking idiot is blocking three. But it turns out that none of the three are good. Then this motherfucker starts checking the tires on the one that you're backing into. Like, come on, man. And tires is just the basics. You still got to check the BITs and the Federal. Make sure it has pins. If it's missing one, then you better carry that, that piece of trash with you to cover it up. And don't get caught with it out, out in the public highways. Because I heard that that ticket for a missing pin is like 250 bucks each. You're You're welcome to use chains if you have to. I've gone through scales with chains on the back part of the container laying across the chassis. I've put a chain in in one of the front pins as well, and I haven't had any issues. Both times I went through the scale. When you're at the chassis pit, you got to check for wobbly pins. So the wobbly pins, those will deceive you because you'll have them set to, to the unlocked position. But by the time you go and get your container with all the movement, they're in the locked position, so you'll get the container set on top of them. And sometimes people get sent to the flip line because of that. They're unable to have the container sit properly on the chassis. So a trick for that that I would use, I would carry tape with me, like clear tape, like for boxes, for moving boxes. Or get some of those rolls of the ceramic wrap. But they have some at Home Depot. They're green, and they come with a little roller. That's faster. You know, do a couple rounds of that. And you make sure those shit stay locked. And then when the container's on, the minute you twist it, it just rips it. And you'll be able to lock it with no problem. Since we're on the topic of checking shit, when you're at a warehouse and you pick up the empty, check the pins there as well. You'd be surprised how many guys take shit out of the terminal and don't lock the pins. Also, make sure the doors are closed. You don't want to be knocking people's mirrors off on the freeway or end up on on the Continentals page, right? Check the lug nut. I lost a wheel once coming out of this this one yard. As soon as I made the left onto PCH, I saw this wheel roll past me. And that's the moment I knew I fucked up. Embarrassing shit. Had to get off and run after it, make sure it doesn't collide with the oncoming traffic. Eventually, it came to a stop and... I had to take the walk of shame as I rolled it back to my truck and waited on the side of the road for the tire guy to show up. Another thing you want to check is the landing gear. If it's missing the handle, more than likely it's going to roll down on its own as you drive with all the vibration. So keep an eye on that. I would hate hooking up to containers with, with fucked up landing gear. That is hard as fuck. Even with the handle, it's hard to lift that shit up. I would hate when it didn't have the handle. What I would have to do then is is go hook up to the container, you know, set the parking brake and, and all that for safety. Then go under the chassis in between the legs. You look up, and I would see that rod and twist it front or back and figure out which way the legs are going and go from there just raise them high enough to pull that load out and then do it outside where it's safer because i would hate being in a pinching point you heard of guys that that die because people are parking containers next to the container that is next to their container right so the the people are parking and they bump that other container what does it do it it fucking crushes your skull you want to avoid pinching points at all times We got to do our best to stay safe. And I know we are under pressure. We got appointments at the terminal. We got appointments at the customer. We make line to get into the terminal. Once we're in the terminal, we make line to get to the speaker. Once we pass the speaker, we make line to get a chassis. 
if we already have our chassis, then we just proceed to make line to get our load. Then we make line to exit, and the cycle continues. It's just survival of the fittest. That's what it comes down to. When I started, I didn't know any better. I was Mr. Nice Guy, the one that everyone took advantage of because I thought common sense applied everywhere. I, I thought, okay, this guy went, so now this guy goes. When this guy goes, I'm next. But then I see homeboy just creeping up, getting closer and closer, and it's evident that he's not going to let me in. And that's when I started realizing that everyone's out here for themselves, the majority. A another scenario of, of being out out here for themselves is when sometimes these guys work long hours and they're falling asleep in the truck, little naps in between the lines, you know, take advantage of that of that little downtime. But suddenly the line moves unexpectedly. And what I've noticed is if you're in the section where you're really close to the speaker and you happen to be surrounded by K-rails, then in that case, the person behind you will be very kind and he'll knock on your door and say, hey, bro, you got to pull up. But don't ever let that happen to you behind the K-rails. Because in this scenario, these guys will just go around you super quietly. They won't even honk. No one will knock on your door. They'll just keep going around you. No one will bother to wake you. That happened to me one time at, at this yard. It's not a terminal. It, it's a yard. It's called Kong Global. I slept outside overnight. I was the first trucker there, and I was under the impression that they opened at, at 7, I believe. Let's just say 7, and I put my alarm for 6.50. Well, it turns out they opened the gates way earlier than that to allow the truckers to start lining up inside. They don't open the gates right at 7, so I made that mistake. The alarm rings. I wake up to find out that I'm at the end of the line, so that's another occasion where I realized that motherfuckers are shady when you come to the ports i'm I'm sure you have a a few stories of your own and the next story i have for you is a very shitty story this is many many years ago when i was a company driver i was at f10 which now is pier e the automated terminal i had been in line for hours the line to get to my location it kind of wrapped around you could see people to the left of me waiting to get to where I was. That's how bad it was. Long story short, I I really had to use the restroom, and that was the first time that I nearly shit my pants. So I'm panicking. I'm like, damn, if I go to the restroom, all this time I waited was in vain. What if I go to the restroom and the machine comes or... All these scenarios run through your head because you don't want to lose your spot. And nature kept calling. Nature kept calling. So I look around. I'm like, man, what the fuck am I going to do? And then it just happened. Damn, I had to, I had to think quick. So I, I got a, a bunch of that company's manifests and I laid them on the bed. I made a nice little bed of manifests, a giant section covered in manifests. And it was bombs away. I did what I had to do. It's a little embarrassing, but I guess not embarrassing enough because a couple of years later, I did it again, except this time, I literally shit my pants, and that shit traveled down my leg, and I was waiting for an appointment at Pierre. Fuck, man. That's when I said never again, and and luckily, I always carry that extra clothes because sometimes I would uh, not go home for a day, and the next day, if I couldn't shower, at least I had to change clothes and it gave me that fresh feeling don't judge me so after that i said never again and that's when i i started fucking with the buckets it started off as like some people would laugh at it but everyone that's laughed at it i'm sure they changed their mind whenever they got the bubble guts and they have nowhere to go at that point it's not fucking funny anymore and don't think i like using the bucket it in my opinion, it's a biohazard issue and should be used only in an emergency. And no, we don't shit directly into the bucket. We place trash bags around it and then we dispose of those trash bags in the trash. And simply put, we all need access to clean restrooms, even outside of the terminals. 
Guys wait outside of the terminals between one up to three hours sometimes. And if they got to take a shit, I don't know what the fuck they're going to do. And if you do get a hold of a restroom, that shit is dirty as fuck. I've seen cleaner restrooms in jail. And based on what I see online, it seems everyone else has access to a decent shitter except port truckers. See, there's this this thing I found about public buildings. Places where the public congregates, such as sports and entertainment arenas, community halls, convention centers, stadiums, amusement arenas, and ski resorts, must have sufficient temporary or permanent restrooms to meet the needs of the public at peak hours. This rule applies whether the building is public or privately owned. Hotels are excluded from this legislation as are most historic buildings due to difficulties in adapting these properties. Then I asked if it's against the law to deny someone the bathroom, and the answer that I found, it was sort of catered towards the restaurant industry, and it said they have the legal right to do so in most cases, and that employers are required by federal law to provide restrooms for their workers, but not for anyone else. So business owners also can't violate any civil rights laws when they say no to someone. The point is that there's this legal stuff out there in regards to people needing the restroom. There's just nothing clear about how it should be in the terminals where truckers have to resort to shitting in a bucket. Then I found this that says how many toilets should be assigned based on the amount of employees. So if the number of employees of each sex is 1 through 15, there should be a minimum of one toilet per sex. 16 to 35, two toilets per sex. And it goes all the way up to 111 to 150 employees of each sex. So that makes it, let's say it's 150 of each sex. So now we have 300 employees. So the minimum number of toilets that corporation would need to have is 12. So you could say it's 25 employees to a toilet. At the ports, the number I came up with is 550 truckers to a toilet. How did I come up with this? See, as of 2018, there were 22,000 trucks registered at the ports. There's 10 terminals, APM, NYK, ITS, PCT, A90, Matson, LBCT, WBCT, Evergreen, APL, 10 terminals. And I'm being generous when I say that there's at least four restrooms available to truckers at each of these terminals. That makes it 40 toilets to be shared amongst 22,000 truckers. And that's how I got 550. And these are numbers from three years ago. So it might be way more. And that's just one of the many issues we would like to bring awareness to in the podcast. Well, moving on. Regardless, we keep showing up. And speaking of showing up, I want to tell you guys a few more stories and tips. One is that if you have a chance to pass by where your container is located and scope it out, make sure it's there, do so because you don't want to wait there all that time to find out it's not there when you finally pull up. Or even worse, it's there and it's damaged. That's what happened to a buddy of mine. It was at APL. Day one, it was congested. He was there two shifts. He didn't get to reach his spot before they closed, so he was out. The same thing happened the next day. On the third day, he finally gets to the container, and it's a damaged container that would not sit properly on his chassis. So the fourth day, it finally got outgated, but it had to be done with a flatbed. And keep in mind that the whole scoping out the area tip, it, it applies to days where there are long lines and you know you're going to be stuck there a while. It's just to ensure that you don't wait in vain. Me personally, every time there's a long line, I, I don't automatically go get in that line. I always go check my spot and if it's open, I hop in. Because sometimes guys just want 
you to join the line with them. They, they hate that they're stuck. They want you to join them, you know. So they see you pulling up to your spot. They start honking. And that shit would make me nervous at first. Like, man, everybody's honking. They're going to know or, you know, like. But in reality, you're not doing nothing wrong because if you fit, then that means that's your spot. If your spot is open and you fit, you're able to park successfully, then that's on them. See, a lot of the guys are stuck in the back of the line sometimes because they don't want to risk losing their spot. But if they had checked when they got there, they would have known that it was clear. But they didn't. They went straight to the back of the line. Security also be fucking up the momentum. They just want to send everyone to the back of the line. They don't even know where you're going and they want you to go to the back of the line. They really are not looking out for your best interest. They just want to look good and, and tidy up the place. You know, bring the, the chaos down to a minimum, traffic management and whatnot. So I would, eventually I stop making eye contact with them and just ignore them and go straight to my spot. Then they go chase you down and get on a power trip. And if that's your spot and it's open, then there's no reason for you to go back. So I, I, I listened to them one time and they fucked up my day bad. They had me wait in a line that wasn't even my line finally got to the front of that line and it was my turn to go next and my spot my role was available to me i literally waited in that line for nothing just to get to the front of it so that i can drive to my spot that was on the other side it was fucking retarded man my spot was literally available to me the whole time that i waited one thing i want to talk about as well is not to be discouraged when you see long lines or you hear stories that the wait times are long by people that don't even work the industry. There may be lines, but it doesn't mean no one is making money. People still get paid. I had a bad day once that I was there from 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. Two shifts at a terminal. At the time, they paid me 40 bucks an hour after two hours. I got paid 16 hours times 40. That's $640 in one, in one day, right? So that's not bad. I mean... It was inconvenient, no food, no sleep because I had to be on the lookout to prevent people from cutting in front because I wasn't really at my spot yet. But $640 to go idle at the terminal, it's really not, not too bad. It could be better, but it's not, like, horrible. I never even made it out with that load, by the way. I blame some stupid-ass driver that kept getting out of his truck and putting his hands in the air. Don't do that shit. They could see your ass fuck it up for everyone else and mind you the terminals are cheap as fuck so they they don't order enough manpower so this guy is up there servicing all those trucks and then to see the guys down there talking shit with their hands in the air then he's definitely gonna say well fuck you too you know what i'm saying so keep it respectful and you might not get skipped there's good days and there's bad days we just gotta make the best of it it was always a a funner experience when you were at the terminal with a co-worker. And on one occasion, it got to the point where the horseplay, it got out of hand, right? So we were waiting. It was during the break. I don't know how it ended up in, at this point, but my buddy took my fucking shoe, man. My It was a... I was wearing Vans, and, and he just slipped that motherfucker right off. And what does he do? He throws it on top of the containers so there i am like a moron climbing the containers to get my shoe back you know that that's how we would fuck around and some guy's way of making the best of it was to walk over to the empty piles and take a shit inside one of the containers others would just call it a day these were the 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 guys that don't like working at night they call them the secretaries the nine to five folk so they would always attempt they would always try to get the load as soon as 445 hit if they didn't get that load they would just exit the shitting my pants incident that was embarrassing but the the situation i'm most ashamed of in the ports that i've ever been in was this one night at 8 p.m i had been waiting a while and i saw a gap so i pulled up and I fit, but for some reason the the machine thought that I was cutting the line, and he kept skipping me. Like on the fifth time that he skipped me, 
by that time I, I had already lost my mind and I did something very stupid. I got out of the truck and I laid down in front of the tires like to stop it. Like, no, like you're not going to skip me this time. So what he did, he just stopped the machine. He turned it off and they left to lunch early at night. And then when the guy came back, the the dock signal came back, but the operator did not. His shift had ended. It gave me a lot of time to think during that lunch break that I had done something very stupid. What the dock signal said to me when he got back made a lot of sense. He's like, man, bro, like, no load is worth your life. Think about it. I was playing chicken with a dangerous machine that if the operator wouldn't have seen me or the dock signal wouldn't have told them, I, I would have literally given my life for a $100 load and some waiting time. Come on, man. Like, how pathetic would that have been? So take some time to think about that. No load is worth your life. The minute you're gone, these companies, they'll replace you in a heartbeat. But your loved ones won't have the same luck. So stay safe and don't rush. A lot of times when I rushed, it ended up in some fuck-ups. My first fuck-up was damaging the chassis on the first trip that I was doing. That's discussed in episode one. I've gotten the wrong container. I just drive out with it. Well, I attempt to drive out with it, and then I find out it's the wrong one. I got to go back, go to the flip line. That takes time. There was a time we were doing Lambridge. Depending on the container that you got, you were told what the destination was, and it was either the BNSF rail yard in Commerce, like a 26-mile drive, or it was ICTF rail near the terminals, like six, you know, five-mile drive. And... I drove all the way to BNSF Commerce, assuming that's where it was going, like on autopilot, because all the previous loads had been going up there, and I just kind of, I just got on autopilot and went. Another incident, because of rushing, I dented the sleeper on my truck when I backed up. The machines, when you drop off an empty or a load, they pull up next to you and, and they honk. So they'll honk once for you to stop. They'll honk twice for you to pull up. And they'll honk three times for you to back up. So for some reason, I went up too much. And I had to back up. When I backed up, I left it in gear. So by the time we took the container off, I was I was ready to hammer down. And I stepped on it. And I went in reverse. And I hit my shit. I've picked up chassis with flats that I find out I have a flat once I'm in my spot. I've damaged landing gear because I, I rolled it up just enough to get out of there and I haul ass straight to my spot somewhere along the way I I hit something I've ripped airlines for being in a rush at BNSF I was on the catwalk I unhooked my airlines and then I jumped off the catwalk and as soon as I landed a yard goat passes by hauling ass and lucky for me I didn't jump too far away from the catwalk I landed like right in the pissing area between the tires and the sleeper. I was shocked. I just stood there like a minute like, oh shit, I was literally about to die. I've been close to a, a 20-foot chassis, uh, an extended 20-foot chassis. Then I'm in a rush looking through my phone trying to figure out where I'm going to go, what ride I'm going to take. The line moves, I speed up. I forget that the chassis is extended and I hit that shit. I have fucked up fifth wheel handles trying to hook up to a chassis sideways. I have dropped loads because the fifth wheel wasn't locked. And I'm sure there's way more fuck ups due to me rushing, but that's all the time I have for today. Uh, I want to thank you guys for tuning in. I I'm excited to bring you all more episodes soon. I got a few guests lined up already, so stay tuned. If you have anyone in mind that might benefit from the podcast, please share it with them. And lastly, if you have any suggestions or requests on a topic that we should discuss, feel free to message me on Instagram. It's at Conteneros, the IG handle. And on YouTube, the name is Conteneros as well. Or send me an email to Luis Molina at Conteneros.com. Thanks again and until next time.